So I hope welcome everyone to part two of our our discussion on the, the Buddhist approach to climate change. So just as our bodies age and die, our bodies have a lifespan, so to the earth has a lifespan and will one day die. Um, scientists say that the sun will eventually become a red giant. It will expand in size and then just engulf the earth, you know, as well as the rest of our little solar system here. And the earth will burn up. Um, and what's so interesting is the Buddha, 2,600 years ago, knew about this process. Um, um, so the, the, the time span from the Earth coming into existence, staying in existence, and then coming to an end, uh, I don't know if it always comes to end with a red giant, but this time <laughs> they're saying it'll come to an end with a red giant. That period of time is called an eon. And the Buddha, when he recollected his past lives, could recollect, what, about 93 or something? Like a large number. So he could remember past lives going on for like a very, very long time. So I'm sure he'd witnessed this process, and so this is why the, he knew um, about this ending of the earth. Um, so he talks about this in Anguttara Nikaya, uh, the chapter of sevens, number 66. And he says, meditators, conditions are impermanent. Conditions are unreliable. This is quite enough for you to become disillusioned, dispassionate, and freed from regarding all conditions. Sinaru, the king of mountains, is 84,000 leagues long, 84,000 leagues wide. It sinks beneath the uh, ocean 84,000 leagues and rises up 84,000 leagues above it, above it. So he's talking about this huge mountain uh, called Mount Sinaru. There comes a time when, after a very long period has passed, the rain doesn't fall. For many years, many hundreds, many thousands, many hundreds of thousands of years, no rain falls. When this happens, the plants and seeds, the herbs, grass, and big trees wither away and dry up and are no more. So impermanent are conditions, so unstable, so unreliable. This is quite enough for you to become disillusioned, dispassionate, and freed regarding all conditions. Now, instead of talking about a red giant, he talks about it uh, as um, more suns appearing. So I'm just assuming it's the same process, but that's the way he talked about it. And so instead of one sun getting larger, he talked about more suns happening. So he says, um, there comes a time when after a very long period has passed, a second sun appears. When this happens, the streams and pools wither away and dry up and are no more. So impermanent are conditions. There comes a time when after a very long period has passed, a third sun appears. When this happens, the great rivers, the Ganges, Yamuna, the Chiravati, Sarabu and Mahi wither away and dry up and are no more. So impermanent are conditions. There comes a time when after a very long period has passed, a fourth sun appears. When this happens, the great lakes from which the rivers originate, the Anotata, Sihapapata, Rathakara, Kanamunda, Kunala, Chandata, and Mandakini wither away and dry up and are no more. So impermanent are conditions. 
there comes a time when after a very long period has passed, a fifth sun appears. When this happens, the water in the ocean sinks by a hundred leagues. It sinks by two, three, four, five, six, or even seven hundred leagues. The water that remains in the ocean is only seven palm trees deep. It's six, five, four, three, two, or even only one palm tree deep. The water that remains in the ocean is only seven fathoms deep. Only six, five, four, three, two, one, or even half a fathom deep. It's waist high, knee high, or even ankle high. It's like the time after the rainy season when the rain falls heavily and water remains here and there in the cow's hoof prints. In the same way, water in the ocean remains here and there in puddles like cow's hoof prints. When the fifth sun appears, there's not even enough water in the great ocean to wet a toe joint. So impermanent are conditions. There comes a time when after a very long period has passed, a sixth sun appears. When this happens, the great earth, earth and Sinaru, the king of mountains, smoke and smolder and give off fumes. It's like when a potter's kiln is first kindled and it smokes and smolders and gives off fumes. In the same way, this great earth and Sinaru, the king of mountains, smoke and smolder and give off fumes. So impermanent are conditions. There comes a time when after a very long period has passed, a seventh sun appears. When this happens, the great earth and Sinaru, the king of mountains, erupt in one burning mass of fire. And as they blaze and burn, the flames are swept by the wind as far as the Brahma realm. Sinaru, the king of mountains, blazes and burns, crumbling as it is overcome by the great fire. And meanwhile, mountain peaks a hundred leagues high, or two, three, four, or five hundred leagues high, disintegrate as they burn. And when the great earth and Sinaru, the king of mountains, blaze and burn, no soot or ash is found. It's like when ghee or oil blaze and burn, and neither ashes nor soot are found. In the same way, when the great earth and Sinaru, the king of mountains, blaze and burn, no soot or ash is found. So impermanent are conditions. So unstable are conditions. So unreliable our conditions. This is quite enough for you to become disillusioned, dispassionate, and freed regarding all conditions. Meditators, who would ever think or believe that the earth and Sinaru, king of mountains, will burn and crumble and be no more, except for one who has seen the truth. So, we don't know exactly when this is going to happen, but it's going to happen. And just as we can hasten the death of our own bodies by not nourishing them or abusing them or treating them badly, so too we can hasten the, the death of the earth by not treating it properly. But even though this is inevitable, just, you know, our bodies are going to die, but we still take care of our bodies. You know, we still exercise and try and eat good food or whatever. So uh, even though the earth is going to, to end, we need to take good care of it, you know, up until that point in time. So how do we do this? So from the Buddhist perfect, um, uh, perception, we start with cleaning up the environment of our own minds. That's where we start. Um, so Thich Nhat Hanh wrote a book called Peace is Every Step, and so he sort of talks about that in there, that first of all, um, I think he wrote this, uh, and he was talking about people who go on peace marches and they're screaming and yelling, <laughs> it's probably not very peaceful. <laughs> so he said, first of all, we have to develop peace within our own self, and then we need to develop peace within our family, and then we can go out and peacefully you know, demonstrate for work for world peace. So it's the same thing if we're going to work for uh, 
helping the environment of the earth, we need to first of all clean up this environment within ourselves, our greed and our ill will, and then we can properly uh, work for it externally. Another place this is talked about is in the Dhammapada. The Dhammapada is a collection of the so the verses that the Buddha spoke, it's probably the most um, famous collection of the Buddha's words. And this is Dhammapada number three and four, about uh, hate never dispels hate. They abused me, they hit me, they beat me, they robbed me. For those who bear such a grudge, hatred never ends. They abused me, they hit me, they beat me, they robbed me. For those who bear no such grudge, hatred has an end. For never is hatred settled by hate, it's settled only by love. It's only settled by love. This is an eternal truth. And then the Buddha says this even more graphically in his simile of the saw. This is in the Jima Nikaya 21. And he says, Even if low-down bandits were to sever you limb from limb with a two-handed saw, anyone who has a malevolent thought on that account would not be following my instructions. If that happens, you should train like this. Our minds will remain unaffected. We will blurt out no bad words. We will remain full of compassion, with a heart of love and no secret hate. We will meditate, spreading a heart of love to that person. And with them as a basis, we will meditate, spreading a heart of love to everyone in the world, abundant, expansive, limitless, free of enmity and ill will. That's how you should train. If you frequently reflect on this advice, the simile of the saw, do you see any criticism, large or small, that you could not endure? And the meditators answer, no, sir. <laughs> So the Buddha says, so meditators, you should frequently reflect on this advice, the simile of the saw. This will be for your lasting welfare and happiness. So what these teachings are telling us is that there's no place for righteous anger. You can peacefully go about environmental work, but not angrily go about it. So what does the Buddha further say about cleaning up the environment of our mind? Basically, it's all of the Buddha's teachings, but Bhikkhu Analyo directs us to the Buddha's teachings on harmony. And these are found in Majjhima Nikaya, number 31. And here the Buddha is, uh, he's gone to visit three monks. The head monk was called Anuruddha. And the Buddha says, I hope, Anuruddha, that you are all living in concord, with mutual appreciation, without disputing, blending like milk and water, viewing each other with kindly eyes. And Anuruddha replies, Surely, Venerable Sir, we are living in concord. But Anuruddha, how do you live thus? Venerable Sir, as to that, I think thus. It is a gain for me, it is a great gain for me when I am living with such companions in the holy life. I maintain bodily acts of loving kindness towards those venerable ones, both openly and privately. I maintain verbal acts of loving kindness toward them, both openly and privately. I maintain mental acts of loving kindness towards them, both openly and privately. I consider 
Why should I not set aside what I wish to do and do what these venerable ones wish to do? Then I set aside what I wish to do and do what these venerable ones wish to do. We are different in body, venerable sir, but one in mind. Good, good, Anuruddha, the Buddha says. I hope that you all abide diligent, ardent, and resolute. Surely, venerable sir, we abide diligent, ardent, and resolute. Just a minute, let me see if I want to read that far. I go to the end of nine. Yep. Um, but Anuruddha, how do you abide thus? Venerable sir, as to that, Whichever of us returns first from the village with alms food, prepares the seats, sets out the water for drinking and washing, and puts the refuge bucket in its place. Whichever of us returns last, eats any food left over, if he wishes, otherwise he throws it away where there is no greenery or drops it into water where there is no life. So they were being very respectful of the environment. They weren't throwing out their food where it was going to cause harm to the, the, the environment. He puts away the seats and water for drinking and for washing. He puts away the refuge bucket after washing it, and he sweeps out the refectory. Whoever notices that the pots of water for drinking, washing, or the latrine, latrine are low or empty takes care of them. And every five days, we sit together all night discussing the Dhamma. This is how we abide diligent and resolute and ardent. Good, good, says the Buddha. So, so here, what this is talking about is getting away from this me, me, me. I want things my way. I don't you know, care if it's not helpful to other people. I don't care if it doesn't help the environment, if it's harmful. I just want what I want. So this is the opposite of this, saying, like, what is the community need that I'm living in? You know? And we can extend that, like, what's, it, you know, what's good for the environment, instead of just me, 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 but like us all together. Uh, how do we take care of one another? How do we take care of the environment? So just moving away from this self-centeredness. So then, after focusing inwards, um, so we've talked about uh, anger, we've talked about harmony, and now we can start moving outwards, and we can start with these, the, the, the Brahma Viharas, the beautiful emotions, as we did in our chant at the, at the beginning. And uh, Bhikkhu Analyo talked about in his um, meditation. So they're, they're called the four Brahma Viharas, the four beautiful states of mind, or the four boundless states. So this is from Digha Nikaya 33. One meditates, spreading a heart full of metta, that's loving friendliness, in one direction, and to the second direction, and to the third, and to the fourth. In the same way, above, below, across, everywhere, all around, they spread a heart full of love to the whole world, abundant, expansive, limitless, free of enmity and ill will. And then the same thing for the other Brahma Viharas, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. So the practice of metta or loving friendliness, that releases us from ill will. The practice of compassion releases us from harming. The practice of mudita or sympathetic joy, that releases us from discontent. The practice of equanimity releases us from sensual desire. And of course, this is all temporary <coughs> until we're fully awakened, when you can have those states present all the time. So compassion is probably the main Brahma Vihara uh, for us to practice for the environment, as it's wishing no harm to all beings. 
And compassion is not just the absence of harm. Um, it's also wishing others to not suffer for any reason. Um, and we don't dwell in the pain of the other. Rather, we're holding a positive vision of, of them, of others finding relief from their pain, from their suffering. It's interesting, um, in the guided meditation, I was taught a different meaning of empathy. Um, Bhikkhu and Alio said that we want compassion, not empathy, but uh, what I was always taught was sympathy was when you took on the suffering of others. So that's a very unhealthy thing because you just made yourself sick if you sort of um, take on, the, sort of resonate sympathetically with somebody else and just feel their pain. Whereas I was always taught that empathy was understanding and having care and concern, I, I think almost like compassion, um, but not taking on the pain, because that's the state we want to be in. And Bhikkhu Nalio is saying it can actually be a joyful state if your mind is focusing on, you know, the well wishes that you have for other people or for the earth. Um, so I'm just going to read uh, this again. So this is now from Ajima Nikaya 99. Again, a meditator abides pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with compassion or with a mind imbued with sympathetic joy or a mind imbued with equanimity. And, and in the paragraph before, it said with a mind imbued with loving kindness. Likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth, so above, below, around, and everywhere and to all is to himself. One abides pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with equanimity, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. When the deliverance of mind by equanimity is developed in this way, no limiting action remains there. None persists there. Just as a vigorous trumpeter could make himself heard without difficulty in the four quarters, so too, when the deliverance of mind by equanimity is developed in this way, no limiting action remains there. None persists. This too is the path to the company of Brahma. So this is how we're encouraged to hold our mind with these three beautiful, these four beautiful qualities of loving friendliness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity, not with righteous anger. Okay, now I hope we have time. Uh, I want to read from Anguttara Nikaya in the Book of Fives, number 162, because the Buddha is telling us how to cope with people who hurt us or with people that we see hurting the environment, uh, either physically or verbally, or both physically and verbally. How, friends, should resentment be removed toward the person whose bodily behavior is impure, but whose verbal behavior is pure? Suppose a rag-robed um, meditator sees a rag by the roadside. They would press it down with their left foot, spread it out with the right foot, and tear off an intact section and take it away with them. So too, when a person's bodily behavior is impure, but their verbal behavior is pure, on that occasion, one should not attend to the impurity of their bodily behavior, but should attend to the purity of their verbal behavior. In this way, resentment toward that person should be removed. 
and how friends should resentment be removed toward the person whose verbal behavior is impure, but whose bodily behavior is pure. Suppose there is a pond covered with algae and water plants. A person might arrive, afflicted and oppressed by the heat, weary, thirsty, and parched. They would plunge into the pond, sweep away the algae and water plants with their hands, drink from their cupped hands, and then leave. So too, when a person's verbal behavior is impure, but their bodily behavior is pure, on that occasion, one should not attend to the impurity of their verbal behavior, but should instead attend to the purity of their bodily behavior. In this way, resentment toward that person should be removed. And how, friends, should resentment be removed toward the person whose bodily behavior and verbal behavior are impure, but who, from time to time, gains an opening of the mind placidity of mind. Suppose there is a little water in a puddle. Then a person might arrive, afflicted and oppressed by the heat, weary, thirsty, and parched. They would think, this little bit of water is in the puddle. If I try to drink it with my cupped hands or a vessel, I will stir it up, disturb it, and make it undrinkable. Let me get down on all fours and suck it up like a cow and depart. They then get down on all four, suck up the water like a cow, and depart. So too, when a person's bodily behavior and verbal behavior are impure, but from time to time they gain an opening of the mind, placidity of mind, and on that occasion, one should not attend to the impurity of the bodily and verbal behavior, but should instead attend to the opening of the mind, placidity of mind, that they gain from time to time. In this way, resentment should be removed. How, friends, should resentment be removed toward the person whose bodily and verbal behavior are impure and who does not gain an opening of the mind, any placidity of the mind from time to time? Suppose a sick, gravely ill person was traveling along a highway and the last village behind him and the next village ahead of him were both far away. He would not obtain suitable food or medicine or a qualified attendant. He would not get to meet the leader of the village district. Another person traveling along the highway might see him and arouse sheer compassion, sympathy, and tender concern for him, thinking, Oh, may this man obtain suitable food, suitable medicine, and a qualified attendant. May he get to meet the leader of the village district. For what reason? So that this man does not encounter calamity and disaster right now. So too, when a person's bodily and verbal behavior are impure, and they do not gain from time to time an opening of the mind, on that occasion, one should arouse sheer compassion, empathy, and tender concern for them, thinking, oh, may this venerable one abandon bodily misbehavior and develop good bodily behavior. May they abandon verbal misbehavior and develop good verbal behavior. And may they abandon mental misbehavior and develop good mental behavior. For what reason? so that with the breakup of the body after death, they will not be reborn in the plane of misery in a bad destination in the lower world, in hell. In this way, resentment toward that person should be removed. And then it's interesting, the Buddha puts one more condition in here, and this is the person who has good speech and good behavior. <laughs> and so you can just think of the time when envy arises. You see somebody who's a good person and then you, you feel envy or maybe some resentment. So he covers this situation as well. How, friends, should resentment be removed toward the person whose bodily and verbal behavior are pure and who from time to time gain an opening of the mind, placidity of mind? Suppose there were a pond with clear, sweet, cool water, clean, with smooth banks, a delightful place shaded by various trees. 
Then a man might arrive, afflicted and oppressed by the heat, weary, thirsty, and parched. Having plunged into the pond, they would bathe and drink. And then after coming out, they would sit or lie down in the shade of a tree right there. So too, when a person's bodily and verbal behavior are pure, and from time to time they gain an opening of the mind, placidity of mind. On that occasion, one should attend to their pure bodily behavior, to their pure verbal behavior, and to the opening of the mind, the placidity of mind. In this way, resentment toward that person should be removed. Friends, by means of a person who inspires confidence in every way, the mind gains confidence. These friends are the five ways of removing resentment by means of which a meditator can entirely remove resentment towards whomever it has arisen. So this is the attitude that we want to have, you know, for dealing um, in a situation where we're seeing people who are being abusive to the earth, to the environment. This is the attitude that we want to have in our mind. Um, so just to finish off, um, the Buddha gave um, gives examples of being kind to the environment. And of course, he lived in a very less polluting time than us. They didn't have cars or factories or anything. He walked everywhere. Um, uh, as you could see in the little reading I did from Anuruddha, they were very careful where they threw out their leftover food so that it wasn't uh, polluting. Um, uh, they had a rule not to travel in the rainy season because if they walked on the rice dikes in the rainy season, it would sort of destroy them and then it would be, you know, just make things very difficult for the rice farmers. So in the, in the rainy season in India, they would just hunker down in a forest monastery somewhere for the three months of the rains. So this is called the rains and that's what we're in right now. Uh, this is the rainy season in those countries. Um, and then I found in Majjhima Nikaya 21, the Buddha said, suppose that not far from a town or village there was a large grove of sal trees that was choked with castor oil weeds. Then along comes a person who wants to help protect and nurture that grove. They cut down the crooked sal saplings that were robbing the sap and throw them out. They clean up the, entire, the interior of the grove and properly care for the straight well-formed cell saplings. In this way, in due course, that cell grove would grow, increase, and mature. So it's just one, one example, I'm sure out of many, where he talks about things that, that we can do. So of course, life is much more complex now. <laughs> and so many, we have so many more ways that we can harm the earth. Um, and there are many ways that can be engaged. So here, with this group, we're trying to, to help with sort of the inner environment, with letting go of the anger, letting go of greed, developing harmony, and then t you know, developing the Brahma Viharas, and then taking that out to whatever lay group you get involved with, you know, if you so choose to, to, help, to help the environment. Um, and Bhikkhu Analyo talks about how mindfully facing climate change can be a path to awakening uh, because it's, it gives us so many opportunities to work on transforming our anger and other negative emotions and developing compassion. Certainly lots of opportunities to see the three characteristics of impermanence and suffering and not self. Uh, and just suggests in, in this domain to use breath meditation or compassion as uh, meditation practices to support you. Okay, so we have a few minutes um, for discussion, questions.
myself, I have some more curiosities about this aspect of anger. Um, uh, in my personal journey, expressing anger wasn't um, like many of the women I know wasn't um, necessarily an emotion that was accepted. And so, um, kind of re-actually discovering my anger and expressing that and putting you know the nose and the boundaries um, is something that I find um, necessary and so I'm just curious about um, yeah this expression of anger and what is within it that it, I don't think it necessarily anger means exactly harm on someone something else but a message that um, that there is a a stop or a no and so I'm just curious about yeah. kind of this as this yeah more aspects of anger. Yeah I think um, yeah we can set boundaries and protect ourselves without anger but anger is usually a feeling of being disempowered and so then you get loud and blustery and whatever as sort of some kind of a defense mechanism to protect yourself. But if if you know inside, like if you're really solid with it inside that um, this is what's, this is how I should be treated, this is how human beings should be treated, this is how women should be treated, and you know that and you set boundaries, um, you can say no you, you know, you can get help, you can do all of those things without resorting to, you know, like yelling and screaming. At, at the same time, I do think there is a journey. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that, I think that um, for sure anger is a hindrance. It's, it, it, there's, there's never, uh, it, it's never going to be um, good to, to act from anger and um, it is uh, something that for women for sure we've had a lot of conditioning around it uh, being unacceptable and not mirrored just I mean these are sweeping generalizations you know and equally often uh, our male our male counterparts have had have other emotions that have not been accepted and mirrored for them. Um, so anger is a there is a protectiveness in anger, and anger is often often it's arising because there has been uh, in some kind of uh, mistreatment or some kind of invasion or some kind of boundary crossing. So, I think, um, I think understanding, oh, this is anger and there's some valuable information in it. And um, learning to um, learning to I was thinking of things like make friends with your anger, like not not rejecting your anger or suppressing your anger or denying your anger. If anger's there, anger's there, and embracing it, just uh, letting it move through, I guess, and learning from it, but then never never acting from it. Uh, but but you you'll never be able to not act from anger if you don't come into some kind of healthy relationship with your, with your anger. That, mm -hmm. that uh, it, it arises and it's, it's acknowledged and then, it's, then it moves through. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, like a working... Yeah, what I will system. say is, um, you know, having some of those same patterns, you know, then being in therapy and um, 
you know, this idea of expressing anger towards my parents and hitting pillows and this kind of thing, that in, in the Buddhist teaching and my personal experience with that is that that actually is feeding the anger. That's actually giving it this life force and then adding to it. it so the, I know in therapy it's often this idea you need to express your anger and my personal experience with that is doing that actually has increased anger. It's, 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 I've not found it to be skillful or what the Buddha is teaching. I don't understand what you mean like Christ. What you mean like Christ? I don't understand. What, what's when, you, when you um, have a, a, sometimes therapists will do things where take you, out like you to, like yeah, you get the anger out and, um, but it's through things that are, you know, expressive of anger, like a shouting or a hitting. And I've all, I've, my personal experience, and I've heard other meditators talk about that too. Um, they found that that's actually feeding the anger and giving it more force and more life and more energy. That is good. No, not good. Yeah, the, one of the first things I did when I graduated in psychiatry is I had the punching bag removed from the uh, psychiatry unit because I had read the research and it just showed, it just made things worse. Um, yeah, it just sort of fed it. Um, but I must say, uh, one of the most effective therapies I trained in was body-centered psychotherapy. And there, we do release, maybe with some words or with some movements, but it's done in a very mindful, controlled way in the therapeutic session. It's not just like flailing and you know screaming and yelling and punching things, which I, the research shows is not helpful. But um, you know, we when we're in a trauma situation. You know, our response is fight, flight, or freeze. And of course, if you're being traumatized when you're a small person, you know, a child, or if, if you're being traumatized as a petite female by a, you know, a large male or something, then the reaction is going to be freeze because you haven't got the opportunity, you know, the fight or flight is not going to work. And so the idea is that is trapped within our body, that fight or flight uh, response is trapped. And there are some beautiful therapeutic ways to release that. But it does not include going and yelling at your parents or punching punching bags or, or things like this, but, but there are ways. Um, yeah, so I, I think, you know, we talk about the holding technique, and you can read about that on the website. Uh, so when strong emotions like anger arise, we hold them, you're not expressing them, you're holding them. As Aya said, you're learning from them, um, and, then they, and then they pass. And um, yeah, so each situation is going to be different, what needs to be, what needs to be done about that. But certainly my experience working with people is the it's the people with the teeniest egos who do the most trashing of things. It's because their ego is so tiny that it doesn't take anything to squash it. And then they just have this huge violent reaction and they can just trash a place or whatever just because they're trying to get sort of some kind of sense of self or of protection or uh, something. So to me, anger is like, um, yeah, it's just. Uh, its expression is just not healthy. It, yes, setting boundaries, saying no, saying what's not appropriate, very healthy. And that comes from feeling empowered, you know, that mm -hmm. this is what's right. Uh, other things are wrong, and you just stand up for yourself. And, and coming from a calm center has so much more power than somebody's just flailing, filling around and 
you know, yelling or screaming, uh, very ineffective. Somebody who's coming from a strong, quiet center. But, you know, depending on the traumas or the, the life experiences you've had, you know, that may take some skill development or therapy or whatever to get to that place where you feel empowered and you can just, you know, just firmly but calmly say no and set boundaries. Go ahead. I was just going to say, um, ask, with a lot of these teachings, you, you talk about, um, I don't know, first working on yourself and your mind before mm -hmm. going out. Mm -hmm. Is there like a, are you going to know when you've got there? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's probably a process. You go out and then when things don't go well, you think, okay, i got to do some more inner work. <laughs> okay. um, I was just going to ask if, kind of back to the idea of sort of strong negative emotions, what does Buddhism have to say about exercise? Because I have to say, like, in my personal experience and most of my friends, if you're having strong negative emotions, if you just get outside and move, you feel better. But I've never heard it in any way kind of addressed in a Buddhist perspective. Yeah, I can't, um, I can't recall what the Buddha said specifically, if you have an emotion, go out and walk. But he, he certainly encouraged I mean, and mostly for exercise, he talked about walking. He certainly encouraged walking as a way to keep the, the body healthy. And he did a heck of a lot of walking all over northeast India. You know, I did a pilgrimage there, and we drove for days in a bus, and he did all that walking. <laughs> so he talks about it as a healthy thing to do, but I haven't heard a one-on-one -on -one with, you know, anger or something like this. But he certainly encourages it. Yeah. Roddy. Yeah, just some clarity around. And for him, keeping the body healthy, the reason is longevity, or why? Well, we have the gift of this, you know, our karma has brought us into this human life, and this is considered a very a good realm to awaken from because uh, it's not like being in a hell realm where you're you know you're just suffering all the time or whatever and it's not like in a heavenly realm where just everything's so lovely you just don't think about <laughs> working on your issues but here we've got a nice combination of pleasant good things and then difficult situations or whatever um, you know, so the difficult situations sort of raise our awareness about suffering and, and, uh, and then the easeful times give us the, you know, the time and energy and ease with which to, uh, to work on them. So if we, if we take care of our bodies, we've, uh, I mean, it's hard to meditate when you're in pain or sick or whatever, and so if we take care of our bodies, we're in a better position to, uh, to do our spiritual practice, to, to meditate. Yeah, it talks a lot about that, like having good digestion, like this is all, these are all very supportive conditions. It talks about them being supportive conditions for your for practice. Like, for like your practice yeah. yeah. And Ellen, um, I think, uh, you know, Definitely, the, throughout the suttas, the Buddha is talking a lot about the litmus test of our practice. The litmus test of, of any tool that we're picking up is if unwholesome mind states are decreasing and wholesome mind states are increasing, do this. This is the, and so he talks a lot about skillful means. And, um, and, and that's the litmus test. So if you're doing something that's like, wow, 
this is really helpful. This clears the heart, clears the mind. You know, it 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 is like a reset button. Then the, the Buddha does talk about that. But, yeah, thanks. Yeah. It's the same thing, right? If you're exercising, it makes physically and mentally you feel better, and you're probably in better conditions to Certainly. do your practice. Certainly. Please. I, I will mention, just to be the devil's advocate, that there's a certain there's a certain point in the practice when exercise is like a way, uh, there's like a pressure cooker, and it's a way to let off the steam really effectively and quickly. But someone who's really interested in cultivating the mind, um, can learn to let off that pressure through meditation or mental development. And then if they were to get up and exercise, that would actually be a distraction. Mm -hmm. So there, there are different ways at different times. Yeah, mm. yeah I mean, what I found um, working with people who didn't have any meditation training, like taking them out and just running with them and having them do, like be mindful of their footfalls and their breathing or whatever, could quickly get them settled down. Um, and, and you couldn't expect somebody like that when they were bouncing off the ceiling to sit down and meditate. So I think uh, I agree with you um, that eventually you have the skills and you can do that. And then you can learn from, from that experience. But for somebody who doesn't have a solid practice yet, you know, it, it's certainly very skillful, you know, rather than going out and punching walls or doing other unskillful things. So the Brahma Vihara we're ending with today is very appropriately compassion. <laughs> So if you want to, first of all, bring to mind somebody you know who has great physical or mental suffering, and while being aware of their difficulties, direct these phrases to them. May you be free of your pain and sorrow. May you find peace. And now send the phrases to yourself. May I be free of pain and sorrow. May I find peace. Now bring to mind someone who's been very supportive of you and send the phrases to them. May you be free of your pain and sorrow. May you find peace. Now bring to mind a neutral person Maybe somebody you pass on the street or a clerk in the store and send the phrases to them. May you be free of your pain and sorrow. May you find peace. And now bring to mind someone you have a difficult relationship with. Send the phrases to them. May you too be free of your pain and sorrow. May you too find peace. May all beings be free of pain and sorrow. May all beings find peace. Remember that all beings face great potential suffering, no matter how fortunate their immediate circumstances may be. This meditation does not eliminate suffering. What we are doing is being able to acknowledge suffering, to open to it and respond to it with a tenderness of heart, which allows us to join with all beings and realize we are never alone. May the merit of our practice be shared with all beings, named and unnamed. Therese, Lise, Blair, Lynn.
Be well and happy. Thank you, everyone.